Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for coming out on this St. Patrick's Day, um, 2015. <laughs> and um, uh, welcome to the uh, Sunday lecture series here at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, Laboratory of Anthropology. My name is Tony Chavaria. I'm the curator of ethnology here. And it's my uh, pleasure today to uh, introduce uh, today's speakers as part of this lecture series, which is presented in conjunction with our current exhibitions, um, What's New and New, Recent Acquisitions at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, and celebrating 20 years of the Friends of Indian Art. But today, uh, so we'd like to again to introduce Ernest and Veronica Benali. They are both um, Diné jewelers. Uh, Ernest works with both silver and gold and loves lapidary work. And Veronica approaches her jewelry designs with a uh, motherly perspective, deeply rooted in her respect for her own family and culture. So please welcome Ernest and Veronica Benali. Thank you. Well, uh, like mm -hmm. Tony said, we won numerous awards. I was just thinking about amazing where, where we're at now, mm -hmm. even to sit here in front of you guys to talk about our work. Right. You know, I've been doing it for about uh, probably 35 years now. And uh, this is something that I started as a teenager. You know, I started probably when I was 16 or 17 years old while I was still in, uh, in mid school. And one summer year, I decided to look for a job. You know, it's like, just like an ordinary teen, you know, your mom tells you, you gotta get a job <laughs> for the summer. So I did, I tried, to, I tried to get into the restaurant, being a bus boy or something like that, you know, so I couldn't land a job in that area. But um, Gilbert Ortega's had a manufacturing in Gala back in uh, 75, 76. And so um, I asked for a job there, and then I got hired in there. But what I was doing was I was just putting, putting a shine back on, on, um, on silver, on their finished jewelry, because uh, they had a manufacturing, and they would finish it, and you know they'll go step by step. And so uh, what I'll do is I'll brush them, and I'll shine them, you know, bring them back to shine. And that's what I was doing. I didn't know anything about jewelry making. I didn't know anything about what a torch was or what, what gauge of silver was or anything like that. I didn't know what type of uh, turquoise or, you know, that was in the jewelry that I was shining. Well, anyway, in the summertime, I worked in there. And, and one of my other friends, his name is Philip, we both got hired in there. And so uh, I guess we're just fast at what we did. And we're, we got good at it during the, that time we were there. And our, 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 our summer vacation was up, our summer break, we were ready to go back to school. But, um, but uh, Paul Ramirez, he was the manager. He came in and he told us, how would you like to work after school for a couple of hours? So we agreed and we said, okay. So after that, we would go in after school and I would go in and work on that. And then after that, um, it, came to where, it came to Saturday for us to go in. Because yeah, all the other workers that work from 8 to 5 want to have their weekends off. But me as a young kid didn't have anything else to do. I said, okay, I'll come in on Saturday. And so some of the other workers then come. So Paul would tell me, you want to grind down the, the stones on these, on the rough inlay? I said, oh, okay. So then I began to work with the, with the grinding machine and how to grind down the stones. So I got really good with the grinding machine, grinding down stones. So from buffing, I went to um, grinding down the rough edges on the stones. And then after that, it's, uh, probably, I, I'll probably last about a couple of years with Gilbert Ortega. Gilbert Ortega closed his shop in Gala, moved to Scottsdale. After that, I just went back to school, continued my school. And then after that, I seen an ad in a newspaper with another manufacturing opening up in Gala. And uh, it was Sunburst Handcraft. And the owner of that was Lionel McKinney. And so with my experience that I got from, from Gilbert Ortega's uh, manufacturing, I took that to uh, Sunburst. And Sunburst, uh, Lionel, he noticed on how good I was at different things that I was getting done for him. So instead of this um, buffing, I, I started as a buffer again with Sunburst. After that, I began to just grind down stones, what I was doing. By the time you know it, I didn't have anything to do. So my sister, Rita, 
she was she was doing lapidary work for uh, Summers. So uh, after that, she told me, would you sit down and you know she'll give me one of her pieces that she's working on. So I would sit there and I would inlay it for her, and I would get her her stuff done real quick with her. And I got the hang of it like that, just working, learning a little bit, you know, inside the shop. And then Lionel came on, he seen me, he goes, how'd you like to have your own pieces to inlay, he told me. And I said, okay, I'll give it a try, I told him. So he would give me like two rings, and all the experienced inlayers would have like 10 to 20 rings I'd be working on. So he would give me two, and I would get that done right away. From two, I went to 10, then from then 10, I went to 20. So I, I progressed pretty, you know, pretty fast in the lapidary work. So I did lapidary work for seven years for, uh, for Sunburst Handcraft, and that's where I got all my training in uh, different types of stone. And then after the seven years, I didn't know how to do silver work or goldsmithing. So Lionel decided to put me from, uh, into the silversmithing. So Lionel showed me how to do silver work, and he taught me how to do goldsmithing. And then plus at the same time, I had other silversmith in the shop that will come and tell me how to do it too, and help me along too. The same thing with the lapidary work. I had help from uh, other uh, people that were working in the shop. So I worked with Lionel at Sunburst for 11 years. So and then after that, I decided to go on my own but um, I didn't have any equipment. Um, so I started to work, I stayed with Lionel, and then I started to work with uh, Ray Tracy. I don't know if you guys know Ray Tracy. He's a pretty well-known jeweler too. And um, Running Bear, Jerry Alkins. So, and then um, Turquoise Village. There's four different people that I was working with. So mostly I was working you know, constantly day and night to keep everybody's order. And then after that, so with the money I was making, I bought me a grinding machine. And then after that, I got me a stone cutter, a settling torch. And then after that, I started to buy silver. And then after that, I started to build my own piece. At the same time I was building my own piece, I was still working with uh, Lionel McKinney in, in the other shop. And then after I got enough, I got, I, to me, I thought, you know, I had everything, so I decided to quit Lionel McKinney after 11 years. So after that, I told Lionel that I was going to go on my own and see what I can do, you know, and he said, okay. So after that, I branched out on my own, and I did wholesale there for a while, and then after that, uh, our, fir my f our first show that we ever done was the Indian Tribal Indian Ceremonial, and then after that, uh, from the Inner Tribal Indian Ceremony, I thought that was the only show that we we're gonna do. But we met other people at the show, like Glenn and Opal, that invited us up to do a show here in Santa Fe at the Hilton of Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. And so we set up there. And then from there, you know, my cousin Foster Yazi, he goes, you should put an application for the Santa Fe Indian Market. I said, oh, okay. So, um, and then uh, Floyd Vicente. Right. Floyd Pacenti came by, because you need to put an application up there. So Floyd goes, let's go up there. Come on, Ernest, let's go up there and get you an application. So from Santa Fe Hilton, we went up to the, the plaza, and I, and I signed up for an application for the following year. And then after that, the following year came, but I was on the waiting list. I was like the 16th artist, I think I was on the waiting list. And 16 artists, I was thinking to myself, and they said, people are really going to sell out, you know, and they're going to put artists in. But anyway, I came up, and I signed in. By 10 o'clock Saturday morning, I got into the market. <laughs> and I was surprised. I said, wow. Yeah. wow. So Saturday, we, we started, um, I mean, we started to sell. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I've been in the Santa Fe Indian market. Mm -hmm. Got our permanent booth where we've been at for about 10 years yeah, now. Yeah, it's been about 10 years. Yeah. And after that... But my first award that I ever won with the ribbon was back in uh, 1985, and that was at the ceremonial. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was uh, 25 years old when I first won my award, and ever since then, it's, we've just been winning. And um, I think I thank God for all of this, you know, his mm -hmm. guidance that he took me, you know, to, to learn all of this, and the people that he brought me that were there to help me. Mm -hmm. And you know, not just that, even the people that he, he brought to me 
you know, to love our work and to purchase our work. You know, we thank God. You know, we, we've been through a lot. I remember our first show that we did um, after the Indian Tribal Union ceremony, we went to um, Oklahoma City, and, and Veronica filled out an application for a show over there. And um, we got accepted, and we went, and we have uh, one, three children, five. five children, and we loaded them up with $200, and we said, okay, <laughs> let's go. We're going to go all take a trip. We've never been out of Gallup, or so we went, and then the show, and then we went to the show on Saturday. We had a, it was a very blessed show. We, you know, we had cash sales and everything, because at that time, we were really starting off. We didn't have a credit card machine or anything like that. And we're just getting started, so we had a blessed show. Mm -hmm. And then after that, during the, the summertime, what I'll do is, um, you know, I like for my kids to carry this on, what, I, what I've learned from different people, and, you know, to where I'll teach, I taught all of the kids, all of the kids know how to do lapidary work and silversmithing. So the kids learn how to do all this. And now I'm bringing other kids into the shop during the summertime that want to learn. And so I've been teaching them. Mm -hmm. And I want them to carry on this, uh, the inlay and the silversmithing. And now all the silversmithing that I do <coughs> is from, it's all fabricated from the sheet on the, you know, the sheet of silver. And I'll cut it to the size. And you know, we all have different gauges, different size wire. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just put it together. And I still hand make it. You know, cutting the silver with a saw, soldering, still like that. I still sit down and you know buff my own stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, so and I taught everybody and all the kids on how to do this. But um, I think with the, working with Ray Tracy, I think with Ray, Tr you know, when I got started with this, I was only working with four different types of stone. I was only working with the red coral. Uh, Sleeping Beauty Turquoise, the Mother Pearl Shell, and the Black Akama Jet. Those were the four colors that were popular among the, you know, the Zunis use that a lot. And, and then in the manufacturing, that's what we're using too a lot. And then after that, um, I started working with Ray Tracy. Ray Tracy was working with um, Lapis, Sujalite. You know, he had all these different types of stone into that he was putting into his jewelry. So I worked with him and he kind of introduced me to different types of stone. And I didn't, I didn't know there was a higher grade of sujolite and lower grade of sujolite. So with him, I kind of learned the, you know, the different types of um, stones with him. And I worked with Ray for a while and then after that, I, I went on, like I said, I went on my own. So I let go of Ray after I bought all my equipment. And and then after that, that's when um, I just began to show the kids on all the different types. And that's where that's Veronica that's comes in. And then Veronica, <laughs> she was working um, at a silver place, mm -hmm. and that's where I met her at. Mm -hmm. she would, I would kind of pick on her, <laughs> tell, me, tell her to cut 25 um, cuts of 12-gauge uh, for me, which is one of the thickest gauge to where <laughs> I don't think she could cut that. <laughs> So that's where I met Veronica, and then after that, we've been together for about five years, and, and then after that, eventually, got she, she got pregnant with our son, Justin, and then she quit her job, so, yeah. so during that time when she was home, she started to sit down and learn how to do this, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's how she picked it up, and ever since then, she hasn't had a, in, another job. She yeah. loved this so much. Who's <laughs> <laughs> a job enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you everybody for coming, and I am thankful for, um, gosh, yeah, I, I am thankful to God for just opening different doors, and I'm thankful for, like, everybody that's here, all of our customers that just, gosh, it's like, um, I'm always amazed to see the people that come into your life and, like, how they change it. It's um, the different doors that open up. I, I'm really thankful for that. So I, I really appreciate you guys for coming out and listening and wanting to learn more about our art and I guess our processes. Yep. Um, my husband did teach our children and he did teach me how to do the silversmithing and the stone cutting, the lapidary work. And we do, um, 
when we do like purchase our silver and our stones, we, we try and look for the highest quality of all of our, our stones. And we like to use that into our pieces because, um, you know, I see our pieces like collector pieces eventually. Like there's only one Ernest Benali, there's only one Veronica, there's only um, like one Vernon Husky. It's like we have our own like different styles or signatures of work. And so um, I think that these eventually will be, you know, art pieces, one of a kind. And um, we, um, we, we like to produce quality work. Yeah. And um, yeah, we are from the Navajo tribe. I am Makia Ani and born for the Towering House. And my husband is? Um, Sitna Jini and uh, Bet Ani. Yeah. So if you have one of those clans, it could be my brother or my, <laughs> my sister. <laughs> yeah, you could be related to us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, I think as far as like our art, I see it always evolving. I think like being Native American, it's like we want to be contemporary, but yet a lot of the colors that I like to use, we try and integrate like traditional colors into our pieces. And um, it's always interesting to see like um, some of the things that like, like young, younger people come up with or people that go to school and learn different techniques, the things that are the processes that they, they are, they're learning. It's, I'm always encouraged to see what people are building next or what's new that's going to be out there, or even like new gemstones. Like this past um, February, we went to the gem show, and my husband was in pursuit of looking for rubies. I was like, where do you want rubies? You know, I was thinking, that it's really not Native American, but in my husband's mind, there's this piece that he wants to build, and it's going to have rubies. And so... We went hunting all day Saturday, and he found his rubies. So <laughs> I'm anxious to see what he comes up with because, like in my husband's mind, or um, like for me, like I have to draw on a piece of paper what I want to make. I I measure it. I think about the gauges. I uh, think about the colors, and so I'll draw it out. And the most, the majority of them at the time, what my husband does is he sees a piece in his mind, and we'll go to the supply store, and he'll be like. I'm going to make this. I'm like, okay, so he's buying all this silver, and he's like, I'm going to do it like this, I'm going to do it like that, and this is going to be the bottom plate, this is going to be the top plate, this is going to be the bezel. He sees everything, and he doesn't even draw it. <laughs> and I'm like, how do you do that? But he does. And so sometimes, um, like with some of our <coughs> customers, they'll have like a concha belt or a necklace, and we don't even have a drawing of it. My husband just built it, and I'm like, how can you do that, you know? But he's, he does that. And that I'm always encouraged or amazed by him of how, how he thinks like that. I'm like, one of these days, eventually I think I'll begin to think like that. But right now, I need pencil and paper, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and uh, you know, th this is some of the, probably the last drawing book I, I got that I've done. Some of my kids even get a hold of it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, my designs usually comes, you know, it's like a, sometimes some of the designs that I did came from the customers, you know. They'll tell me, uh, you know, you should build a piece like this, or, you know, it's like, oh, okay, you know, the, I won't, you know, because they're collectors of, uh, like, a, they'll be collectors of a certain, uh, like a, a bear or a, a turtle, and um, they just wanna, they wanna see what I can do, you know, building a piece like a turtle or, or a bear. So I, w I would do that for them, you know. Because they're, you know, some of them are very good customers. So, okay, I'll work with them like that. So I'll build stuff like that for them, special pieces. And that's how I go into, like, the turtles and, you know, just different things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I know Veronica's won numerous awards, too. So I, I can't remember when her first award that she's won. I don't even keep track. <laughs> you see, you see uh, mentioned that you see a difference in, in the creativity of different artists mm -hmm. uh, working closely together. Have you maintained your own individuality? I think I've tried. In the beginning, when I first started to inlay, my husband was showing me like patterns to do. It's like we can basically do any type of pattern of inlay that you see anywhere. Um, I think because we're that good. 
But um, I think over the years, um, yeah, just like he has his own identity and like I have my own. I like to do the, like a lot of Ernest's pieces like will have a story. Mine will be like more of that carnival. I like like Charles Loma pieces, mm -hmm. that style. I was like, wow. When I first seen one of his pieces, I was like, whoa, you know, this is nice. How do you do that? So I told Ernest, I said, how do you do that? He goes, oh, that's easy, he says. And I'm like, it doesn't look easy. But for him, I guess for someone that's been in lane for a long time, it is, you get, you, you start to know the stones, the stones and the shells. So I think now I've, I've, I've more, um, like for my jewelry, it's more of like the corn roll, the, the raised corn roll inlay, the integration of the different, like the oyster shells and the turquoise. That's like more of my style. Like the piece that's in the exhibit right now for the concha belt, that's the type of the inlay that I am more known for. Whereas my husband's pieces have um, like their, their, it's got the flat channel inlay or that there'll be a story attached to it or um, like sun faces or drilling into the stone. So I, yeah, we've, we've um, yeah, we do have separate identities, even with our kids too. Um, we have three of them that are really good silversmiths and inlayers too, and they each have their own style. And that, that's encouraging. Yeah, that's encouraging. Yeah. What kind of stones or product do you particularly like to use? For me, I like to use spiny oyster shell. Um, spiny oyster shells and turquoise. That's what I. I like to use, and I think um, mainly because they're like warm to me, and I think one of the things about living in New Mexico is the sun rises and the sun sets, and every day the sun rises, it's a different color, and every day when it sets, it's a different color, and I always think like, wow, that's a painting like from God, and that painting was like done for me today to see. And so that's, that's why I think I'm more drawn to the, to the reds, the oyster shells, the turquoise, the coral, and the purple. Those are like some of my favorite colors. Michelle. And then for me, um, most of the, the inlay or the designs that I get is probably like what, what I picked up, you know, working with Sunburst Handcraft. Um, Lionel was the designer on the jewelry that I would build for him. So uh, most of these designs, this, you know, you know, I'll use a little bit of it still, you know. And then I, and then um, I think the first, my favorite stone that I like to use the most is probably turquoise. I always gotta have turquoise in there somewhere, and uh, and turquoise is used in a lot of the Navajos love turquoise. You know, they say that um, like in the morning, all the Navajos, you know, the traditional. They like to wear their turquoise, and then the man would have the headband and the moccasins, and they would do their prayer. And that's the way that, you know, God uh, recognizes you, they say, is by wearing the bead, the turquoise. You know, it's his, it's his birthstone. So I like to put that in anywhere. Tur if you see turquoise, in, you know, I like to put that in, in each of my pieces that I do. Oh yeah, uh, the next trip was in rubies, yes. Yeah, 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 he will. The American turquoise, yeah, yeah. It has to be ma mainly natural, yeah. We like the, the natural American turquoise. And we do use China Mountain turquoise because the mine is so massive and it is a natural turquoise. But we do incorporate the, sometimes the China Mountain turquoise, but, um, we prefer the American turquoise, yeah. Mainly sleeping beauty. But um, I think it's getting harder to get. And then most of my designs with the with the sun faces or whenever time I do a face, those design, you know, like for me, I, I was, um, you know, before, I guess as I was growing up, my mom and dad were always traditional. Mm -hmm. And then, um, they had, they had a lot of friends, a medicine man and stuff like that. And then they, they would tell me, because you can't be doing that, you know, because you're not, or you're not supposed to mess around making faces as the only medicine man can, you know, like do sand paintings and stuff like that with the, 
faces on the sand. And if you do it, you know, doing it on stone, you can't do that, or else you, you know, it's going to mess with your mind and stuff like that. He goes, and then after that, they would tell me you need to have a, a you know, like a ceremonial done for you, like that. And then so, so believing that, what I did is, you know, I had ceremonials done on, you know, like with the faces mm -hmm. or any type of uh, dancers that I put onto my work and stuff. You know, it's probably like that for even, you know, anybody who's going to do a kachina of the one of their, uh, you know, that's used in their ceremonial. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure they did. Just like for me, I was told that to where I had to have a, I think it was like a four-day ceremonial done for me. Mm -hmm. And um, you can't visit the outside. You have to stay in the whole garden, then step out for a little bit, come back, you know. I, I went through, I don't know, I would say probably maybe more than five different ceremonials in, in my lifetime just so just to respect the, the, the Navajo elder and, on what they wanted me to do. But now, you know, I can, I can work with it. But I still have, you know, other traditional Navajos come up to me and, and then, you know, they'll mention that to me. But me, I know I had it done, so, and then I just, um, and then I agree with them, I tell them, you know. Yeah. Close down, but, um, is it, uh, with the mind that you're using, are you finding it more difficult to get it? Yes. Yeah, it is more difficult to, to get. Um, I hear that the Sleeping Beauty mine closed last year in July. June, June July. July yeah. One of the months last year. Nobody's um, mining um, Sleeping Beauty no more, so S Sleeping Beauty is just going to be like a uh, Number eight, spider web, it's yeah. going to disappear pretty right. soon. Right. We went down to the gym and mineral show because they have a booth down there. <laughs> we went down there and they just had little tiny pieces that I couldn't yeah. work with. Right. Right. And the color of it is really a, a light blue. You don't have that real nice dark blue anymore. Mm -hmm. Like when I started, like I said, when Veronica was working in a, a supply place, I can go in there and I could see big old trays of Sleeping Beauty turquoise for $12 an ounce. Nice big pieces, nice color. Mm -hmm. No, nope, can't do that no more. Yeah. It's right small. Yeah. Can you tell us about some of your pieces that you have up here? Or? Yeah. Yeah, these are some of our pieces that we got done that we have up here. That's true. That's and true. Copper. Same thing with copper. They've, a lot of the artists have moved from silver to <coughs> copper or even from silver to nickel silver. I think when we started out the silver market, the, the base price was probably like at anywhere from $4.75 to I think the most I seen it for within a good five, eight year period was maybe $7. Yep. And now it's we buy silver at the last market was at $29. Yeah, twenty nine dollars an ounce, and then last year in May or was it two years ago? It was like at forty nine dollars. Yeah. So when you like go to like the art markets and you see like a ring that an artist had like maybe two years ago, and then maybe they remade the ring today, it might either be less silver or it might be like two or three times more than what it was originally, because of the market. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, and because of that too, a, a lot of our friends who are artists or, um, you know, like uh, right now they're getting jobs. You know, yeah. yeah. The I was at the Hurt show and there's a one artist that well that's always doing shows. He said he got a job at the Two Arrows Casino, so he says he's gonna give up the the artwork and just go to work. Yeah. So yeah. it is tough for some of the artists out there. Yeah. Yeah. Have you worked with Argentium? No. No, we I've, we've never worked with it. What's that? Um, Argentium. It's it's a, it's a. It's a, a higher grade sterling. Right. Between sterling and fine. <coughs> oh, okay. That never tarnishes. Doesn't tarnish. <laughs> right. Yeah. We've never tried that. No. Yeah. Never. Do you think your experience um, with working with people, older people? 
people that should we be engaging? Is that typical, or is there more um, sort of secrecy, and they don't want to help a young person? I think these days it seems there's more secrecy. <laughs> But I think when Ernest was learning, or everybody was like, it was it was like a gift, and then the gift should be shared, or you know, encouraged. But these days, sometimes it's like you run into people, like we have like um, like other artists that are just starting into the silver um, silver industry, making jewelry, and they'll come up to us and they'll ask, oh, how did you do that, or how can I get this stone to shine like this? And usually we're you know we're free with the information. We'll just tell them. They're like, gosh, you guys are really open about how you polish or how you've made it, because we ask so and so, and they're not, they don't want to tell us. And I'm like, okay, that's it. Yeah. So it now it's weird. It's like I don't know. Yeah, it is like shift. that. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> but um, what's me? You know, this is not something that um, my mom and dad taught me. You know, this is something that I learned in the manufacturing and. I had other people show me how to do this, so mm -hmm. I'm willing to share it with anybody right. on how to how to do any of the stuff. Right. And that's why I bring in, um, you know, students so I can show them, and you know, they can go on if they want to do it. They can do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something they can always fall back on, because our daughter Venus, she's in college, and she done this on the side to get her through college mm -hmm. until she got a job and. No, she only does it whenever she has time. It's like a hobby now for her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you still use uh, an acetylene torch or, or a compost? No, I use the acetylene torch still. Mm -hmm. You don't find it dirty or? Mm, no. Yeah, we still use the acetylene torch. Because mm -hmm. sometimes I think we want that big flame on the, a bigger piece that we're working on. Mm -hmm. Not, not necess no, not in school. It's mainly in the summertime at our at, at our house. At our shop. At a, right okay. next to our house, we built a little shop, and so we'll have like um, like we had our nieces in for a couple of summers, and then last within the two years, we've had like local local kids, neighborhood kids, that um, you know, our kids are real friendly with all of the neighbor kids. And so for a long time, my house was just full of kids. <laughs> <laughs> I was like the first cafeteria of the neighborhood, you know? <laughs> it seemed that way. <laughs> right after school, after they get done with the homework, all the neighborhood kids would come over. <laughs> and so, you know, you just get used to it. So it's like my, 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 friend, my daughters and my sons, their friends would come over, and their little brothers, little sisters. They're the ones that are coming over now just to visit, and so they they come into the shop in the summertime, and they're they're curious, and sometimes they just sit there and they just watch, and then um, it just leads into questions, and they'll be like, "Well, can I can I try it?" And so Ernest will say yes, and we'll get them some copper or some inexpensive excuse me inexpensive material, and we'll go ahead and just let them experiment. Yeah, let them get the hang of it or let them try it, yeah. Yeah, because right now I, have, I will be working with uh, a 10-year-old girl. Her name is Rochelle. She's going to come into the shop mm -hmm. Yeah, this uh, this summer, so she'll be one that I'll be training now. I guess just by word of mouth, it gets around and all of a sudden, yeah. <laughs> so how will you start with her? What will she do to begin with? Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll see what, what kind of idea she can come up with. <coughs> You know, I'll tell her to draw a design, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe she has something in mind. Mm -hmm. And then if she doesn't, then we'll go ahead and sit down. Um, sometimes what we'll do is we'll just, we'll end up, you know, just pure uh, sterling silver beads. Yeah, we'll do that. Because right now we have a show that's going to be coming up in August at, at the Indian Tribal Indian Ceremonial, and they have a youth competition. Mm -hmm. So I try to work with the students to get ready for that show mm -hmm. so we can enter their pieces. Mm -hmm. And every student that I worked with had entered their pieces mm -hmm. and they've been sold on the opening, was it yeah, preview, preview night? night. And they win awards too. Yeah, they win awards. So that encourages them awesome. and they're like, yeah. I'm gonna buy my school supplies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so 
yeah. and that really excites them to you know to keep it on keep it going yeah. Yeah. yeah do you do any collaborative pieces you know what we've been asked that a lot of times <laughs> we we <laughs> never did <laughs> one of these days we do got to get together yeah. and be on one <laughs> something <laughs> like that <laughs> yeah yeah, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if Ronica's going to do the silver work or I'm going to do the silver. I don't know which one. <laughs> Maybe I'll do the silver work on it and Ronica will do the lapidary work on it. I'll just think about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. When did you start doing your own gold work? When did I start? Uh, um, well, I learned it with Lionel, so. And then I went on my own. What was my first gold piece? Was it um, probably that gold bracelet that Elizabeth Sacker bought? Oh, okay, that 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 uh, fish bracelet. Well, anyway, there's always this thing of, among artists. He goes, you know, because I've been entering silver pieces into the market all the time, trying to win an award, and they said, no, that silver's not going to do it for you. You have to build a gold piece. <laughs> so a gold piece to win an award. So after that, um, we went and invested into some gold. I think I have it. I had some ribbons that I had won at um, the ceremonial, or I don't know, at one of the shows. What I did is I went and bought gold with it, with the with the prize money. So I went and uh, did a fish bracelet that uh, one of our cousins, her name's Elizabeth. She, uh, I got an award with that. I missed it by uh, what is it, one vote to get in the best of show or right, something like that. Market, yeah. And then definitely I told Ronnie, I said, I guess I did need a gold piece. To <laughs> <win."> <laughs> So I think that was my, I can't remember what year that was, in the 98, 99? 99, yeah, maybe 99 yeah. or 2000. So what kind of a fish bracelet, what did you do? What, was it a fish design or was it a cup? Uh, what I did, it was, a, it was a cuff bracelet and then I did a background with the solid color of um, Larimar. Larimar, Larimar. It's a stone that we found in, um, at the Gym and Mineral Show and it, and it looked like water, you know, water when you look at it. And I did the background with that. And then after that, I did five fishes, five tropical fishes, and I set those on top. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 It was really nice. nice. And, and do you cast anything? Or no? Oh, no, I don't cast anything at all. Everything is um, yeah. is done from the sheet on up. Yeah. And then if we do cast, I work with a, a sand caster. You know, Robert Dotson, he do a lot of the sand casts. And I was trying to learn that too, but I didn't like this, the burn off that was coming off that sand cast. Yeah. Couldn't, I don't think I would survive that. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, everything that I do is just all handmade. Could you hold up a couple little pieces of each of your yeah. displays, like your thought process was to put the piece together? Okay. What's that? Show her one of your cups, and then I'll show her one of mine. Okay, this cuff here, some of these couple of pieces here, I told her, you know, these are going to be my own, like, private collection. But um, the shows were coming too fast, and <laughs> I just had, I just gotten done with eye surgery. I couldn't do anything for six weeks. Mm -hmm. And then I said, okay, I can't do anything for six weeks. I can't use my eye yet, so what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to bring these out, and, you know, and sell them. But def and then I still have them though. <laughs> That's the first and um, <laughs> this one here is done with 12 gauge, you know, 12 gauge. And then after that, I'll put the channel on it, and then I'll, I'll do my, I'll bend the bracelet. And then after that, I'll inlay the back part first to set this up. After I do the back part on this, I'll do the. This is the title of this one is called the twins, or they call them the twin warriors. Or, um, yeah, Monster Slayer. And um, this side is done with Sleeping Beauty Turquoise. And then this one is done with Iron Wood. And then after that, I'll do the background first. And then after that, I'll do the, the bodies, the, the figures here. And then after I do the figures, what I'll do is I'll bend it. You know, I'll, I'll test it on here and make sure it's going with the curve of the bracelet. After I get the curve all done, then I'll start doing my lapidary work on both sides. Your iron wood from Arizona? Yeah. yeah, some of the iron wood that we use is from Arizona, yeah. 
We use everything, like oyster shells. Some people are like amazed, like you tell them it's oyster shells. It's like, what is that? And so now it's like, now we have to start bringing like displays of like the oyster <laughs> shells that we use. <laughs> Because they don't believe it like a shell would have the spikes and then that it would turn from this ugly thing to, you know, like something like that's red and beautiful or, or like bright orange or purple. So it, that's always amazing to see like the customer's reaction to that. But um, yeah, we do everything from handmade. And then like these particular earrings that I have here, well, you can't see them from there, but what they are is that they're stamped turtles. So we do um, use a lot of like the tools um, just to stamp different designs. Like for um, this one, I did a turtle. We do butterflies, dragonflies, and we create whatever we can with um, like, what are these little piston rods? Yeah, the They're yeah, filed rods. and that's what we use to, to make the designs. But um, this is it. This so one it. stamp, you know, like one of these stamps you know, you can turn this thing in different ways. You can probably mm -hmm. do about more than five different designs with the stamp. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it's just getting familiar with your tools or even like getting familiar with your stones because after you've worked with it for so long, you kind of know how the shell is going to look or how the turquoise is supposed to look. How do you cut the, the shell? The shells? It depends on the shell. Like this particular shell, the oyster shell, what I do here is I cut it from ear to ear. It slices this way. And then so it gets rid of that nub. And then since a lot of my pieces are like long pieces, like, like in the earrings or even like in the concert belt that's on display, I have to center it down the middle. That way, when I cut it open, I can see, like this is what it'll look like. I can see the color and the thickness of the color because if a shell's too thin, then I can't use it because the color will grind off as I start to polish it or, or um, work with it. But I'll get familiar with that. And you can always see what the shell's gonna be just by flipping it over and looking at the color here. So the color along that leading edge mm -hmm. represents what's inside. Right, right. So sometimes people mm -hmm. will wet it. I've even seen people like lick it. I'm like, oh, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. But they do do that just to see the color. And that always freaks me out. But um, <laughs> it does. With every stone, lapis, yeah, sugilite, whatever. Yeah, they do whatever. that. Yeah. Because we have like, um, like the lapis and the sugilite. We have, um, there's a guy that always sets up at the Hilton during the Indian market. They're called Kemyab, Kemyab Imports, and they're in Albuquerque. But they carry like the sugilite, the lapis, malachi. Those guys, they bring in all of like the natural material for us and they have like a better quality of supply for us. So we always go to them. Those guys will lick it and that just freaks me out when they do that. <laughs> and then we have uh, two different stone cutters. We have uh, a six inch stone cutter to where what we'll do is we'll cut most of the whole shells mm -hmm. on that one. Right. And they both have uh, diamond blades on it. Mm -hmm. And then we have one that's, um, a four inch stone cutter and the blade is like paper thin I mean it's thin and that one what we'll do is uh, we'll slice more of the smaller fine pieces on that one yeah so through the years me in lane and whatnot I, I've been initiated you know cutting the tip of my finger my thumb off or something like that you know but they do cut skin you gotta be real careful with those right. blades right so, so the blades are like a small circular saw right Tiny. Yeah, and then what we'll do is we have water running through it to keep the blade cool, and mm -hmm. and then plenty of water in there to keep the dust down from the, you know, from the shell. Right, right. You ever use a diamond blade in your jewelry shop? Yes, it, it is a diamond blade. Yeah, yeah. We, um, the six inch diamond blade, and then the we use like a little four post inch. slicer, four inch post slicer. That's the paper thin one, but we do use that, and you, it gives you a better cut and if there's less waste with a diamond blade. And then even with the, the drill bits that we use are all diamond drill bits. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the ring you're wearing? We're all admiring it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How you made it, what you thought was about it. Thank you. Yep, this is yep all sterling silver. It has a square wire edge bezel, and then I blackened it, the edges with oxidized, and then there's a sheet of bezel on the inside. It's got the natural Mediterranean coral and with the Sleeping Beauty turquoise. And these guys I sell for like 300 bucks. 
Yeah, but they are natural. And um, yeah, you can order them. Do you use liver of sulfur? <laughs> liver of sulfur? No. No, it's purely just like Winox. Um, we've tried different oxidized materials, but um, the only one that we've used is the, the, the Winox that's yellow, but never liver of sulfur. I think that one you have to boil for the longest time and it just gets into the air and yeah. you just won't like the smell of it after. So we, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we kind of get away, stay away from that, yeah. Because yeah. even, even <laughs> our, in our shop, when, when I was building it, I put these blowers in there, mm -hmm. knowing that, you know, it'll take the dust out, and even the oxidation film, even the burn off from the, from the, flux. What you, from the flux. So we have blowers in there that we turn on and everything is going at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then we have like the waters running through the grinding machines and the, the cutters, just to make sure, to keep the dust down and then Mainly just to keep the stones cool, because when they get too hot, then they'll burn and change color, and then you can't can't use it. How, how, what's your technique with working with turquoise? And how do you manage to cut it, shape it? Uh, we use the diamond blade to cut it, mm -hmm. and then to shape it, um, we use either a diamond wheel or a sanding belt. I prefer a sanding belt because it's just. I find for me with the sanding belt, I can control the way it's going to grind. And but with a diamond, it cuts fast for me. And like with my work, I don't, I don't need it cut quickly. I need it to be, I need to be able to control the stone in my hand, and to grind it the way I, it needs to be grinded. That's why I don't use a, a diamond wheel. But Ernest, I use uh, both. Uh, use the a stone wheel. That's which is a uh, hundred grit. And then I use a sanding belt, you know, 100 grit. It all depends. If I'm working with small pieces, I use a stone wheel. But if I'm gonna, like this, the the background of this, if I'm gonna use, um, if I need to grind a long piece real nice and straight to where the other straight piece meets, I use the sanding uh, the sanding drum because that's about four inches wide, and I can get more of a, a straighter cut. Mm -hmm. With the stone wheel. You know, I'll be using it in one area all the time to where I'll be working a groove into the stone wheel. Mm -hmm. So uh, constantly I had to get the T-bar and straighten out the, the stone wheel again and then dress it again. Because mm -hmm. that one, that, it's not a true straight all the time. But the sanding belt is a, a true straight every time you... And the, the wheels, they run so true. You know, there's no bounce in it. You can't even tell that they're running sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's how smooth you need the machine to run to, to do some really nice inlay work. And then we use, um, like to start off, we'll use the 100 grit, a sanding belt 100 grit with water. And then to finish it off, um, to give it like the smooth, almost polished look, we use, it. we use a 600 grit sanding belt with the water. And then a lot, a lot of the pieces, um, what will end up happening is we'll hand sand them hand sand them to get the grooves off of it, and then we'll um, use, um, what do you call it, sapphire powder. It's like, um, it almost looks like cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> they, sell, they sell it in like quarter, quarter bags or little ounce bags. I'm like, oh my gosh. Gosh, one time we got stopped <laughs> by the cop. And we had our scale, our gram scale, and the <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> and I was like. You did this every night. I really. And I did. Yeah, I didn't think anything of it, but in a cop's mind, a gram scale means, you know, you're a dealer. So I was like, oh my gosh. And so he took our gram scale and everything, and I was like, why did he take our gram scale? Does he know how much those are? We need that for our turquoise. But I guess in his mind, he thought we were dealers. <laughs> 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 huh? No, he didn't. Wow. No, we never got it back. Yeah, because sometimes when we, when we buy um, supplies from different people, and everything's by the gram, you know, dollar gram for the sujolite or even lapis, dollars, 60 yeah. cents a gram. So that's why we had the gram scale with us. Yeah. Well, anyways, back to the sapphire powder. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they sell the sapphire powder like an Indian jewel supply or Thunderbird. And what we do is we put like a, gosh, not even, just maybe like a half a quarter teaspoon into a bowl. We mix it with a little bit of water. And it's just paste. 
And then we have this machine, this motor, and on the edge of the motor is like a flat drum. And it's an elk skin that we blew onto that drum. And so what that does is um, as it's rotating, we use that paste, the sapphire powder, and we use a little toothbrush and we just hit it. We use the, put the sapphire powder onto that elk skin. And that's what gives us the polish for our turquoise, the pseudolite, um, the malachite, yes. all of the harder material, that's what will polish up the stones. That's what we use yeah, mm -hmm. for our work. And that's a, uh, among the, some of the artists, they'll, they'll ask us, you know, they'll look at our pseudolite or our lapis. How do you get that really nice shine on there? Mm -hmm. We'll just tell them, well, we'll do the, the rough grinding with the 100 grit, and then we'll use a 600 grit. And then after we're done with the 600, we'll hand sand it to get all of the facet, or you know, you know, whatever the wheel leaves on there, we'll hand sand it with the 800 grit. And then after the 800 grit, we'll take it over to a sapphire powder, and they'll give you a really mm -hmm. nice shine. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's part of the process. Yeah. yeah, and that is uh, our step of making jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's, this, there's this one gentleman that I'm, I met too, he's telling me, he goes, what do you do with all that stuff, you know, from the buffing machine, you know? I said, we just sweep it up and throw it in the trash. He goes, did you know most of the, the gold companies that refine, whoever works in the gold, they wear, you know, uniforms, they put slippers on their shoes, and then the, when they're done, they take it all off and they put it, throw it in a little barrel, or, and they refine that. And then so after that, I started to save um, all of our buffing scrap. Everything. We sweep the floor, everything goes into that brown, um, like a bucket, like a, 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 a cardboard drum. We fill the one up, and the Ronica goes, what do you have that around? This is trash, throw it away, he tells me. Wow. It's just taking that room in here. I said, no, I'm gonna cash that in one of these days, and it gets full. <laughs> and then after that, it got filled. She goes, okay, it's filled, now move it outside. Or <laughs> and then after that, I, it sat outside for about a week. I said, I better take care of that, you know, because cause I'm busy all the time. If I'm not doing jewelry, I'm doing some type of construction work, you know. I do a lot of that because my dad used to do that, so you know I keep myself busy. Well, anyway, I made it down to one of the supply places, and I told him that I had a, a whole barrel of buffing Trash. stuff. Everything that was in the shop went in there. They go, oh, okay, yeah, we can refine it. We can send it to a refining place for you. Just bring it down. So I took it down there. They weighed it and everything. And then after that, they told me it would uh, probably be about two weeks. So they send it, and I forgot all about it. And then they called me back and they said, we have a check over here for you for, what is it, $3,700? Oh, yeah. I said, what? Yeah. <laughs> I, was I, said, I said, yeah, they sent us a check for your refining and stuff. And then on the, the paper, they even separated the gold oh, from, yeah. from all of that. Yeah. So you had the gold and then you had the silver. I said, man, right. there was, there was yeah. more, there's a lot of ounces of gold inside that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so now, you know, we've been saving it ever since then. <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice surprise. My biggest thought would have been, how much did I throw away the years prior? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So ever exactly. since then, I've been telling some of these artists that do stuff like that to uh, start Save saving it. it. Yeah. Well, we hope we've whetted your appetite for um, jewelry and that uh, and they've they doing uh, upcoming shows, and one of them will be Native Treasures, yes. the fundraising um, market for the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, Memorial Day weekend. So we encourage you to please all come down and see their jewelry. Um, we'll have to thank you all for coming out again for St. Patrick's Day. Mm -hmm. And to remind you, the up next upcoming um, uh, talks and lecture series will be on April 14th with Jody Naranjo and Russell Sanchez and John Gillibert Samora talking about pottery. And then the uh, concluding uh, lecture on May 5th with Ross Cheney and Cliff Fragua talking about diverse arts. So we encourage you to, to come out and bring your friends and family to those talks as well. And to thank you again for coming out to see Ernest and Veronica. And uh, to ask you to come down, you know, to, uh, talk to them about their pieces as well. And to uh, join me in just thanking them again for really thank you. Thank you. Thank you.